Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Transforming Depression Through Symbolic Death and New Life Using the Creative Arts with David Rosen, M.D. This episode is part one of the series Transforming Depression Through Symbolic Death and New Life, a Jungian approach to using the creative arts. While working extensively with patients suffering from depression, Jungian analyst and psychiatrist David Rosen uncovered helpful clues to understand this widespread malady. When people feel grief and despair or suffer from suicidal thoughts, they may feel like they are dying inside. In order to regain the will to live, Rosen believes, only a part of them, the false self, needs to die. When the false self is permitted to die symbolically, ego side, through the drawing, pottery, writing, or other forms of the creative process. A kind of mourning process is set in motion. When the cycle comes to an end, the person is transformed and experiences new life, a rebirth of purpose and meaning. This workshop focuses on understanding depression and the quest for meaning, discerning the creative potential of suicide, and recognizing and treating depression and suicidal people. Crisis points such as adolescence, midlife, divorce, and loss of a loved one are discussed. Drawing from actual case material, Dr. Rosen presents the ego side and transformation model, explains how it is applied and how it works, and explores its creative potential. David Rosen, MD, is a Jungian analyst and psychiatrist in College Station, Texas. He is a Macmillan Professor of Analytical Psychology, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science, and Professor of Humanities in Medicine at Texas A&M University. He is the author of four books, including Transforming Depression, A Union Approach to Using the Creative Arts. To listen to the rest of the series, visit our website, youngchicago.org. The talk that I'm going to give this morning is... Let me outline the way it's going to go. I'm going to give you an introduction about what I'm going to talk about. And in that introduction, I'm going to talk about personal issues regarding myself. Because all research is me-search. That's why we're in analytic work so that it's, it's meaningful for me personally why the book was written, and I talk about personal issues in the front of that book, but I'll sketch them briefly for you here, for those of you who haven't read that. Then we'll talk about professional issues. Depression and suicide are common essential issues that each of us must sort out personally and professionally. Usually Jungians do not talk about and do not focus on suicide particularly. That's the most tragic outcome of severe depression. And we need to face that, understand that, and work through that issue personally and then feel comfortable and confident with that issue a clinical entity know what to do professionally. Both of these matters, personal and professional, join together around one's philosophy. So we have to look at, I'm going to challenge you to look at your own philosophy regarding depression and suicide regarding death and life. And there's a light side to this. We'll get into this. not all heavy. Because after all, I'm advocating symbolic death and new life. I'm advocating ego side, not suicide, as a meaningful alternative to actual physical death talking about psychic death of a part of the ego that is 
pushing or pulling you toward the abyss of suicide. That part has to die, not the whole being, which is the real tragedy of suicide. You're going to um, benefit, at least I hope that's uh, how it turns out, I, I think that will be the case, from my sabbatical because I've been immersed in Taoism for six months. And when I wrote this book, Transforming Depression, I, I was not aware, although it doesn't surprise me, of the issues involving depression that are in Taoist works. For example, Lao Tzu said, Darkness within darkness is the gateway to all understanding. So that this statement, which is 2,500 years old at least, has to do with an underpinning that I'm going to highlight in this talk, that depression and darkness is positive. We usually think of depression as negative, as psychopathological, which it can be. I'm not saying that that's not true, but I'm going to focus more on the positive aspects of depression and the drive to kill oneself, which is really meant to be a symbolic death, not an actual death. The author of The Secret of the Golden Flower, Lutsu, said that when the dark is at rest, the light begins to move. And Jung commented on that in what he wrote in his collaborative work with Richard Wilhelm. Darkness gives, gives birth to the light, to light. This is an introduction to how I view depression, which we'll um, go into in, in depth. Before we do that, I want to mention that everyone, all of us, struggle with depression. It is common. It is an everyday thing. It's like every day, night comes. After the sun, it's dark. So every day, we're going to be depressed, and that's all right. We don't have to fight it. We have to accept it as natural, as archetypal. And the end point of that is to think about suicide, to end one's life voluntarily. And almost everyone, if they're honest, thinks about this. But we have to be aware that the ego, the trickster element of the ego, the negative aspect of our identity in collusion with the shadow is trying to pull us into the abyss of suicide. And the capital S self, or the spiritual aspect of ourselves, our totality, does not want to die physically. All it wants to do is to kill this negative part of the ego and transform that depression, that negativity, into something positive through creativity. Uh, my own experience, which I didn't understand at the time, uh, involved a breakup of a, of a marriage. And when I was waiting for my ex-wife in a, in a tavern or bar, and she was an actress, and she came, it was during the summer in Summerstock, and she came out of the theater into the bar with the lead actor, but the play didn't stop. 
they were in love in the play, but it just happened, it just came right into the reality of the moment. And it was like a, a knife into me. So my reaction was not to strike out at him or her, but was to turn on myself, which is what suicide is. That's the only time in my life where I actually became suicidal. And I had a plan to uh, kill myself, to go off the... I was driving real fast on this small island on these roads and or go off a bridge or something, and bang, hit an embankment or something. And then something very strange happened. It's the only time it's ever happened to me. I drove the car into a field. It was at night. There was a full moon, or an almost full moon. It was light out in the night. And I started running through this jungle-like terrain. It was on Hilton Head Island before it was really developed very much. And I left my body. So it was an out-of-body experience. Saw myself running. And then I heard this voice that said, leave. And I didn't understand at the time that that voice was from the capital S self. This was a long time ago. I didn't understand. It's only in retrospect that I understand that. And I left the island. And I went to see a psychiatrist friend in New Jersey. I drove all the way. And I said to this friend, the psychiatrist friend, I said, uh, I'm a failure, which is what people do with something they have failed at. They generalize it. The ego tricks the person to believe that he or she is a failure. And what he said to me was, you are not a failure. You have failed at a relationship, at a marriage. So that part, that ego image of me as the husband, that ego persona image, the mask of being the husband, the identity, the image and identity had to die. I had to understand that to death. I had to kill that, actually. It's a conscious act. So that was my own first personal experience with this. I didn't understand it until I did research years later with survivors of jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge. I've interviewed ten of these people. And every one of them went through a spiritual transcendence. And I had to coin a new term because these weren't failed suicides. That doesn't make sense. So I coined the term egocide, killing of the ego that took them to the bridge. Because that's what died. And what was most striking, and these people were at a thousand-fold risk for suicide, and and some of these people were uh, being followed up after 20, 30 years, 35 years, and none of them had gone on to suicide. So this research became the foundation of a new approach to suicidal people, severely depressed, moderately depressed, and suicidal people to help them to focus on the part that has to be killed, that has to die. And some people don't like the term killing, the ego side, killing the ego. And all that means is it's a conscious effort to get rid of that part, to kill that part off. Uh, Marion Woodman's not uh, upset about a term like that because... She uses terms like psychic murder in her, in her books. And the Germans have the word selbstmord for suicide, which means self-murder. And that's actually what suicide is. So it is a um, conscious, aggressive, violent act. And it doesn't have to be a killing. It can be an understanding to death. I'm not advocating one over the other, but... I use that word because it catches people's attention that it's the ego, not the the little less self, the personal being that has to die. And that's the tragedy and confusion of suicide. Now, the professional issue is a, a great one. 
This is an age, this has been called an age of melancholia. You look at just Prozac, for example, and people taking that and thinking that's transforming them. It's not that easy. As I'm sure all of you know, it can help. I mean, I give antidepressants to people, but that's not sufficient. And I try to get people off the biological medication as soon as possible. Unless there's a genetic predisposition to, like, uh, bipolar illness. Now, at any one point in time, the symptoms of depression manifest in 13 to 20 percent of the population. And we'll go through the actual symptoms, but I want you just to reflect on this. This is 30 to, to 50 million people in the United States. If you take uh, clinical depression, it's at any one point in time, it's 6% of the population that suffer from this. That's 15 million people. If you take a year period, it goes up to 10% or 25 million, and over a lifetime, it approaches 20% or 40 or 45 million. Let's, let's go to the slides and we'll now move into the philosophical. So Oscar Wilde said, where there is sorrow, there is holy ground. And this is um, quickly going to uh, involve your philosophy, your view of depression in your own life. So out of the the sadness, out of the depression, there is a spiritual aspect that often is ignored, not in Jungian psychology, but in um, approach to depression, it's often ignored. And this issue of Depression and suicide on a personal level goes over to a national level. For example, there are nations that, when you think of the ego as the persona and the mask of the nation or identity of the nation, that is self-destructive. You can think of, for example, Germany in World War II. This country because of Hitler, I mean, he ended up killing himself, was on the road to suicide. And it's interesting in uh, Verena Cass' book, Joy, Inspiration, and Hope, the only place that she found significant work on the psychology of hope was in Germany. Why? Because they hit the bottom. In this country, we are focused on hopelessness. You've, you've probably read of Beck's work on depression and hopelessness. He has scales for both. So we can measure depression and hopelessness. But if you think of enantiodromia, this flips so that hope is inside. That's the medicine in response to hopelessness. And Germany found that out when they hit the bottom. Just like in AA, they say you really can't help yourself till you hit the bottom. So you have to face these issues of depression, severe depression, what that means. The issue of suicide, you have to face it squarely, straight on, and get to the bottom of it for it to turn. For you to be able to take that destructive energy and channel it into something creative and to realize that that is spiritual. And through that act of creativity, there will be something spiritual and meaningful come out of it. Just like the end of the, the world, which I call Omnicide or mass suicide, which is a possibility in this age of nuclear weapons. You look at North Korea, for example. It could take one person or a, of a leader of a government like in North Korea or a terrorist who is suicidal 
or doesn't really care about taking everyone with them. So that the we, we don't think of this micro personal issue as being national and world, but it is. During the Cold War, we used to think of that all the time, that the Russian leader or the American leader would press this button and end, end our civilization. The other side of this is reflected in this comment by Martin Buber. There is meaning in what long was meaningless. Everything depends on inner change. When this has taken place, and only then, does the world change. So that each individual has to take responsibility for this self-destructive drive, which I think is related to the ego. It's not related to the capital S self. It's an ego trickster problem. And I had uh, a, a friend who was a reader of my book who wrote me a letter and he said, uh, you know, I think it's the ego in a trickster mode. This came from this friend named Joel Weishaus who said it's the ego as, a, as its last desperate act of control that pulls the individual into the abyss of severe depression and suicide down that road. So that's the the part of the ego you have to kill off and transform. If you have questions as we go along, don't hesitate to ask them. Regarding hope, Emily Dickinson, who, as you know, would probably be... uh, committed or could have been committed to a mental hospital, what she did was to transform her severe depression into creative work. And it became meaningful and spiritually meaningful for her. Just listen to this. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And that's what I'm talking about. That's the medicine, spiritual medicine. Hope is intangible. It's like faith. It's like love. It's intangible. But it's symbolized by the bird, by the spirit. And she knew that because it's archetypal. And it helped her to live a meaningful life in this house in Massachusetts where she was really confined and easily could have been in a a mental hospital. She she never even knew that, that her work was of value to other people during her lifetime. This is a a basic concept for depression. This is the archetype of depression. It's an archetypal image. We can't see the archetype. So this is an image of the archetype of depression. Well, we don't talk about an archetype of depression. This is the yin-yang. This is uh, the Tai Chi of Taoism. But I'm going to suggest that depression is just like this. We, unfortunately, tend to focus on the top half, on the darkness, that it's uh, psychopathological, yes. How do you give people general criminal illnesses who are dying, who are being treated, 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 who are being Mm-hmm. Yes, um, I will come to that, and uh, we will talk about that in in depth. I don't um, endorse that, actually. 
and Jung didn't endorse that. He, he didn't write an essay on suicide, but in his letters, there are four letters, and I'll read to you from those, where his position is really clear. And people wrote to him with illnesses and said, will you endorse my ending my life? And so I'll read you what Jung said. And, and actually, my view is very similar. Now, there are always exceptions to any uh, position so that I could understand that there could be a situation where that might be a possible outcome. Uh, but g- as a general thing, I don't support that. But you could probably come up with an exception, or, or in a discussion we could come up with an exception that would be understandable and, and I- acceptable. So depression, if we think of it as natural, like day and night, that if you endure the darkness, light will come. Part of the the difficulty with depression is that people are tricked into thinking that it's not going to end. And in an impulsive moment, that negative ego which says, you're rotten, you're no good, blah, blah, if the... If the uh, means are accessible, uh, will you'll end up killing yourself or making a suicide attempt. And what I'm suggesting is that if you can endure that, it will change. And you actually can transform the negativity into something creative and spiritual. Let me read you a quote about depression. And you tell me who this is. If you know, don't say anything. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. And this was a uh, obviously morbidly depressed individual. Does anyone know who that is? Lincoln. Uh-huh. Abraham Lincoln. His law partner, Stuart, took all means away from him that he could use to kill himself. Lincoln was morbidly depressed and suicidal for many years. He had support of friends like like Stuart, and this negativity was transformed into something very creative and spiritual. And he and Lincoln looks depressed. However, when you you see what he wrote and what he did for the country, for himself, for the country. That's what I'm talking about, how you can transform that kind of depression. He had no psychiatric treatment. He did not take Prozac. It wasn't even available. There was nothing like that. He endured his depression, and there was a little light in the darkness. And somehow, Lincoln must have sensed that. Because even this statement, to to write anything about how he was feeling, is creative. This is the beginning of the transformation. If you can, this is writing in your journal or whatever. That's the beginning to change it. There are many examples that I give in here of people who transform depression, like William James, for example. The founder of American psychology and philosophy was morbidly depressed and suicidal. And he transformed that and gave birth to these two new disciplines in in the United States of America. Now let me share with you a model of depression that I call a, a cave model. 
let's go back in ancient times during the time of cave people so this group of cave people sees a dangerous event coming in nature a storm or a predator and they go into a cave which is dark and they're going to go into this cave they're going to retreat withdraw go into darkness for protection and that's what people do in depression depression is evolutionary in the sense that it's adaptive we have an innate sense to to remove ourselves from danger and go into darkness to retreat if you think of Anthony Storr's book Solitude Return to the Self he talks a lot about retreat withdrawal and in this dark cave which if you think about it it's a, it's a sanctuary and what did the cave people do in this dark cave what, what would they do sleep. yeah <laughs> sleep okay incubation they would rest and they might have a, a healing dream which we've used i mean a part of uh, Myers work incubation and, and psychotherapy or Escalapius's use of dreams in a healing sense rest and retreat at Epidaurus uh, draw on the walls that's art what what would they do when they they go in there though what build a fire so that provides light warmth And what they're doing is in that safety, and uh, you could think of it as a, a home or a womb, that's where the rebirth is going to take place. Whether it results in a cave painting, communication, uh, hopeful uh, renewal of some kind. This is the basis of the value of hospitalization in severe depression one of the best books you could read and I quote quite a bit from it is William Styron's book Darkness Visible the title is magical Darkness Visible have, have you read that book? it's a short book about his severe suicidal depression it's a memoir, brief, of one of our greatest writers who came to the brink of killing himself, like Hemingway and others who have killed themselves, like um, Primo Levi, etc. And he was, um, he couldn't sleep. He, what, what did he do when he was 60 years old? He decided, you know who William Styron is, Sophie's Choice, etc., one of our greatest writers. At his 60th birthday, he said, I'll stop drinking. He's going to uh, cure himself of alcoholism on his own. So he stops drinking and he becomes morbidly depressed because he was medicating himself with alcohol for years to cover up this depression, which started when his mother died when he was 13. So when he's planning his death and burning his writings, leaving a note for his wife, he hears some music at 3 in the morning, early in the morning. It's a Brahms Rhapsody, if my memory is correct. And this music he associates with his mother. And then the enantiodromia begins. He had been going to a psychiatrist whom he couldn't stand, who gave him medication, and William Styron would, would plead, I, I, I'm suicidal, I'm, I'm horribly depressed, I need to go into a hospital. And the psychiatrist would say, well, let's try this, and you know, we'll, this ought to work. And 
So what he had to do was to hospitalize himself. That, that early morning, he got himself into a hospital and fired essentially the psychiatrist and helped himself, but he viewed the hospital, psychiatric hospital, he describes it as a sanctuary. And he talks about the ugly, green, nasty head that the art therapist made him make, which he talks about in kind of negative terms, but then he says, that was actually all right. So here's art, a creative process different than what he's used to writing. This is making something out of ceramics. And he came out of his depression. And you know when you read this book, Darkness Visible, that's behind him. He is not going to kill himself. He committed ego side. The negative part of himself that was pulling him into the abyss of suicide was killed. And you can understand that by reading his book. It's very clear. So again, the hospital sanctuary womb of rebirth. And unfortunately today, we don't hospitalize people. We try to manage people, manage care. And outside of the hospital, it's, it's very... Um, against nature in a way yes well it's there's not uh, an easy answer to that the question is what if someone becomes dependent on I guess hospitalization or a psychiatric care and there are some people who really need that and can't get that inpatient care which is like uh, a value would be a value and someone could become dependent I mean you could see both sides of that issue Yes. Yes, this is a really good point. Um, yes, actually, I think we need to um, focus on this issue in our culture where people, this was uh, the question about or comment about uh, people don't want to sit in darkness and depression with someone who's suffering. But we need to do that. And in our history, in our culture, the, the problem occurred in a religious sense that being depressed, experiencing sorrow, was viewed as a cardinal sin. So you didn't do that. That was not good. And so you, in the Protestant ethic or the Christian ethic to work, get busy, rather than to immerse yourself in the darkness and to be surrounded by people who would say that's natural. So we, it's a very good comment. Yes? It's uh, my experience that mm-hmm. depression, my personal experience and my experience with other mm-hmm. people's depression, uh, is just blatant, shot through through with meaning. Mm-hmm. Today, as regards the hospital and the what appears to be the ascendancy of biological psychiatry, I think the hospital has more of a potential to be anti-therapeutic because they're going to—they're training a whole generation of people yeah. who they have this disordered neurochemistry. Yes. Take this pill, this pill yes. work, take that. Yes. And they don't—and they buy that because yes. you know it seems reasonable. But yes. They don't change a darn thing in their lives. Yes. One eventually stumble into a more severe crisis. Yes. It's another good point uh, about how your comments about how biological psychiatry and reductionism claims to have the answer for treating depression. And it's only, as you'll see, as we go on in our quest for understanding depression and discerning that, that it's only one one factor out of uh, four that I think are important, which we'll get into. So you're right. And we need hospitals that provide a holistic Environment where all the factors can be addressed, the biological, but equally the psychological, the social, cultural, and the most important, I think, is existential or spiritual, which our hospitals don't address. I had a patient once say to me, in a, in a hospital that was founded by a religion, 
And I asked the patient, I said, well, what's your religion? And she, and she said, this is in a psychiatric consultation, and I always ask that. She said, are you supposed to, no one's asked me about it. Are you supposed to talk about that in here? <laughs> I mean, no one. It's like it didn't belong in the hospital. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. But but it can be renewed. That's what all of you hopefully will help do is not only <laughs> transform uh, I mean we can transform our own depressions but then help our families or communities and to have hospitals that are really uh, doing what they really were set out to do. Yes. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Well, I would be interested when we review depression, how, you, where you think these, uh, is it vibrational, medical um, alternatives fit in? Yes. Yeah. Okay, the other model of depression I want to talk about is the dark underground. You think about that in our psyches. This we have at night. We're we're uh, going into the darkness. It's at night. We're sleeping, and we're accepting the fact that we have seeds from some other place, dreams, creative ideas, images. From it come out of the darkness. So again, it's the light in the darkness of our unconscious that are going to give us seeds, images which can grow and flower and be healing. So that the the it may be some of what you were talking about fits in here. It's a germination process. It's a creative growth process. Out of the darkness, if you think of the uh, germination of the seed in the underground and growth coming out of that, the nurturance of the darkness. The other model is to view depression as a winter, fall and winter emotion. And of course, in the new DSM-4, I'm sure you've all seen this already, there's a whole entry on seasonal affective disorder, which in the lingo in psychiatry is called sad. Isn't that interesting? A person has sad, sad. And what is used to treat this? It's most common in the fall and winter. What's used to treat it? Light. Light. So here's the psychiatrist. So, Ah, you are sad? Let me prescribe light. And that'll cost uh, <laughs> phototherapy, a special kind of light from our research. We th- it alters neurochemicals. Well, and we can bill the insurance companies for this treatment. That's strange when you think about it. And actually, it's not new. Hippocrates described SAD. What is SAD? You know, 2,500 years ago. It's not new. So that this winter emotion, if we just endure, because in the winter there is light. There's less light, but there's light. And look what's going to happen. If you just endure, spring will come in the summer. You could actually get by without the light therapy, because there is light and darkness, remember? When the dark is at rest, the light begins to move. And this is the inner light that will actually help heal you, which I'll show you pictures of, which on this book, on the, on the cover of this book, here's, here's light from, from a, a suicidal graduate student who painted this and it's a luminous 
this light out of the darkness. It's a uroboros. It's a maternal uroboros because in the center is an embryo. And she called this, I have patients title their paintings like their dreams. And I treat them in the same way. She called this giving birth to myself. So that's her new true self. The old false self had to die. One of Jung's views of depression is very close to a Taoist view. Actually, I my contention in this new book, The Tao of Jung, is that is that Jung was a Taoist. And when I got to Zurich on my sabbatical, I went to see C. A. Meyer, who within the first few minutes told me he was the oldest living analyst, Jungian analyst. 60 years, and I, I didn't question that at all. But uh, then I asked him, you knew Jung extremely well. Was he a Taoist? And without hesitation, he said, yes. People do not understand that Jung's psychology is Taoist. So I felt, okay, I'm not on the wrong track. I'm on the right path here. And then I asked Marie-Louise von Franz the same question, and she also had the same response, that his psychology is Taoist. Why? Because it unifies the opposites. Taoism is a unification of the opposites, a whole out of the parts. If this Tai Chi, which is split, originates from a circle called the Wu Chi. And isn't it interesting that the circle is the symbol of the capital S self. So my supposition is that the Tao and the self, the capital S self, are the same. Now Jung's, one of his views of depression, I really like this because the Taoist advocate Um, you could say getting rid of the ego having it be secondary to something higher which is or greater which is the Tao which they don't understand it's a mystery but it's the way so they empty out the psyche which is really what symbolic death is all about the death of the ego. And and I'm focusing on the negative ego because you want to keep everything that is positive, separate out this, this, um, what is not you from your parents. Some things from your parents are you and you want to keep. It's, It's a difficult, agonizing separation, alchemical. We all go through that. So this is what Jung said. The empty stillness which the, he, 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 this is his view of depression, one of them. Depression is the empty stillness which precedes creative work. The Taoists place a high premium on creativity, just like Jung's psychology does. So it involves a transformation. We, we talked about uh, symptoms and the vast number of people who would have one or more of these. You're all familiar with these, I'm sure, personally, and with your friends and relatives or patients or whatever. And these are uh, utilized to make the diagnosis of dysthymia, which uh, is interesting. Does anyone know what that means? Dysthymia? Well, it's the diagnostic term for minor or more mild depression. Right, but what about the actual word? Dysthymia. Does anyone know what that means? The root of, say, thymia, huh? Well, it comes from the thymus gland. Does anyone know what that was used, what that's uh, linked into? The immune system. So that it's interesting that uh, 
there's a lot of research that, that supports the view that if you're depressed, your immune system is lowered and you're more prone to illnesses. It's also a high heart Uh huh, okay. So, mm hmm. Helplessness is when the rug is pulled out from under you. Like when my ex wife and her uh, male actor friend came into the bar. That was. And then the next point is you feel hopeless. Like the, the candle dims, like you feel there's no purpose or meaning. Now here's a view of depression and how complex, complicated it is. So depression can be, I mean, we all view it as normal in the sense that, oh, the person's sad. Or we say the person seems depressed. But we don't think that they're clinically depressed and we have to drive them to the hospital. Maybe they're upset about something. They lost something. They did poorly on exam or they got rejected. They asked somebody out or whatever it is. So you can have sadness or depression. Grief, we allow for this, if, particularly if you are ill, you have to grieve the loss of the part. Say if you have a heart attack or cancer or someone in your family dies or friend, you grieve. But if it goes on too long, and this is cultural, uh, we tend to think you should be over it in three to six months. But if you're in Greece, they give you one or two years, sometimes five years in different cultures to get over it. It's not pathological. <laughs> but we view it as pathological a lot sooner because we want people to get back to work. Here's the SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. Then you have the Unipolar Mood Disorders, the minor, and the neurotic depression was lobbied for by analysts. They just wanted to do away with it. Neurosis. So in DSM-3R and 4, it's allowed to be there in parenthesis. And we now call psychotic depression melancholia, which is interesting. That's an ancient term of black bile from Hippocrates, the humoral theory. See, we're going back into neural humoral theory, so it fits in nicely. Bipolar, cyclothymia, neurotic, manic depression, psychotic. Now, Martin Buber viewed theology in a way that I like to view depression. So the person who knows only one religion knows none. You could say the person who knows only one approach to depression knows none. This is my criticism of biological psychiatry. It's reductionistic, and it puts on blinders to other views. So really they don't know what they're doing because they're too focused and narrow. Now, this is how I understand depression. It's a general systems approach, which is common in science, natural science, biology, in a true sense, the study of life. A systems model means that these four factors are interrelated. It's a closed system, and they all have an impact on each other. For example, if a person in the social factor loses their job, loses their home, so they are jobless and homeless, that's social, we could predict that this would quickly spread in this closed general system to depression. Because it would be depressing to lose your job, lose your home, and you could develop a biological depression. So then the, the person goes to the community mental health center and they give them an antidepressant, which would increase the depleted central brain amines, but doesn't solve the problem. They don't get a new house or a new job. So it's a, it's a, it's a true response. I mean, it, it's a, 
a good treatment, but it's not sufficient. And the, the person could go the other way, and they could say, I've lost my job, I've lost my home, jobless, homeless. Life is not very good. What is the point of all this? I have no home, I have no job, so that might have an impact on their meaning and whether they feel there's a God or there's a spiritual answer or purpose. And both of these can go to the psychological or you can go directly to psychological. I lost my job because I'm no good. Poor self-esteem, etc. It's a psychological problem. It may have led to the loss of job or loss of home. So it's complicated. It's not simple. But it's, it's treated as simple. Well, you come into uh, the community mental health center and you give antidepressant, it's not going to uh, solve the basic problem. It might be that if you provided housing and job training, the person would not be depressed. That would be an antidepressant. Or let's say the person goes into the woods when they've lost their job and, and home, and they go through a, a spiritual transformation in the woods. This is what William James did in nature. Changed his whole life. So the person comes back out, they're changed, and we recognize that. They're not depressed because they lost their house and their job, and they, cut, and they get a new job. Or they start their own business, or they write something, or create something. They feel of value. So that's an antidepressant. But you don't go to a psychiatrist and get it. And in Auschwitz, for example, Viktor Frankl, as a psychiatrist in in this concentration camp, counseled people not to kill themselves, counseled the inmates. He did not have Prozac at his disposal. It was not in the concentration camp yard where he didn't have it to give people. All he had was hope. And he said, human life under any circumstances never ceases to have meaning. And to to say that and practice that in that environment is uh, impressive, I think, to underscore you know, when we think we have problems. If you look at biological factors, and there's another one that's been pointed out that's not listed here, which is physical exercise, because you can change your chemicals through exercise, through nutrition, and that will change your biochemistry. You can take antidepressants and change your central brain amines, but that's taking something from the outside. I'm not opposed to that. I I prescribe those. But I view it as a jump start, not an answer or solution. Unless the patient has a severe, it's a small percentage of the bipolar illness. (coughs) Endocrinological, any endocrine gland at either extreme results in depression. Take any endocrine system, thyroid, for example, Graves' disease, you'll be depressed. You could take myxedema madness, hypothyroid, it's hyperthyroid, Graves' disease, uh, myxedema madness, which is hypothyroid, you'll be depressed. Either of those, you get depression. You take any any endocrine system and, and you'll find depression at either end. <laughs> The immunological system we talked about in genetics, primarily the bipolar disease. But uh, someone had a question at the when we had the break about uh, minor depression being genetic. Well, there may be a, a predisposition to that, and a person might be helped by being on medication maybe a bit longer. But I think you could resolve that yourself utilizing all the factors involved in depression, not just one, and relying on on medication. Psychological factors, psychodynamic, Freudian can be helpful, that that therapy for some people. 
Jungian, behavioral, cognitive. I've seen all these help people. Group psychotherapy, interpersonal therapies, which family and group therapy would fall under that, are all helpful and used in, in conjunction with each other. We talked about job and home, divorce. All of these issues, social factors, can cause depression. Existential factors, I think these are extremely important and generally ignored by mental health professionals and particularly psychiatrists. The most ancient of these is loss of soul. That's how depression is viewed in most so-called primitive societies. But I think our society is primitive. And there's a loss of soul in medicine and in our society in general. A lack of spiritual direction, a lack of meaning, and no purpose or direction in life. So these factors are very important, and it's why Jerome Frank, who's done extensive research out of Johns Hopkins on psychotherapy, and he maintains that the best medicine is expectant faith. which is in this realm. That's the placebo response. Like we have in these double-blind studies for when the FDA tests antidepressants, 30 to 40 percent in all studies respond to the placebo. To the placebo, a sugar pill. It's not, there's no antidepressant in it. However... See, the FDA says oh, this is a good antidepressant because uh, 60 or 70 percent got better. But what they don't address is the clinically depressed people who got better 30 to 40 percent with no so called medication. However, that means the body, through expectant faith, that's the placebo response, got better. Now, if we could just focus on the 30 to 40 percent of placebo response, we might not need the medication. If we could unlock that secret. Now, do you think the drug companies are going to support that kind of research? No. <laughs> but you can do that. We, we can all do that. And it's in this realm. It's not in a pill. However, some of you may do the the research that, that takes you to Stockholm and they'll give you the Nobel Prize. And the research would involve this. You take people who are very depressed and you follow these people, clinically depressed, and the prodrome for spiritual conversion is depression. This, this is an antidepressant. Religious spiritual transformation is, is an antidepressant. You can read William James's book, Varieties of Religious Experience. It's the first scientific study of religious experiences, and it's an antidepressant. So all you have to do is measure, take the cerebral spinal fluid, measure the central brain amines in these people and follow them. And the... 20% who go through a spiritual religious transformation, then you, you check their central brain amines after their religious experience. And I would predict that their central brain amines go up. And then you can go to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. And it would, why wouldn't it work? If this system is correct, general system theory is correct, which I think it is, any of these can. You can also give homes to the homeless, and I bet you that their central brain amines would increase. <laughs> or you could offer long-term psychotherapy to the people who come to community mental health centers. We have no more managed care. And uh, Barbara Lerner in Chicago here did a study of the value of long-term psychotherapy, dynamics, psychodynamic psychotherapy, 
in the poor population because the view was they can't benefit from this. And she proved that that was not true, that they benefited from it. That's a psychological component. And it's cost effective because they're not going to keep coming back, you see, to get medication or this or that if they go through a transformation. Now, here's a... This doesn't look like it's in focus. Will that focus automatic? But I can I can explain it. This is what I've been talking about. If, if you take the inner circle, a person who has a home, the sanctuary of a cave, a womb, a home, that leads to bonds, leads to health, interpersonal relationship. And... In this home, they can uh, conserve energy, withdraw in a supportive environment with warmth and light, and that will lead to hope and joy and meaning in life. And that will lead to purpose. It's a wonderful home and so on. And now we're all going in the right direction. However, if you go the other direction, you're homeless Like I went to see a patient when I was in charge of this psychiatric consultation service at the University of Rochester, Strong Memorial Hospital. I went to see this patient, this uh, gynecologist asked me to come see this patient, and all the students and residents were gone, so I just went to see this woman. All I knew was she was depressed. This uh, gynecologist said, come and see this patient. She's depressed. So I walk in a room. And her son and daughter are standing behind her. She's in the bed, propped up, and she looks at me, introduced myself. She says, oh, you're the, the shrink. They, they think I'm crazy. And so I said, well, I was asked to come, and they said you were depressed. And she said, she looked right at me. She was a widow with uh, uh, metastatic ovarian cancer. And she looked at me and she said, wouldn't you be depressed? Yeah, I'm depressed. Wouldn't you be depressed if they're going to take your home away, pay your medical bills? And what was I going to do? I could do nothing. So I said, yes, I would be depressed. I said, would you, do you want to talk about it? Get out of here. She can't help me. No one can help me. She's very angry. And understandably so. So that is homelessness to pay your medical bills, which is immoral. So that leads to a sense of meaninglessness. This this society is not right, this woman thinks. And so she, she's got her kids, but she's losing her home, and uh, she feels life is absurd, and she feels empty, hopeless, uh, depressed, which decreases her immune system and worsens her cancer condition. She can't fight it as effectively. She'll maybe get a secondary infection. And that leads to decreased central brain amines. She feels um, she, she is sicker. And it's a vicious cycle. So they're all interrelated, these factors. Now, the rate of depression among women is twice that of men. One in four women experience clinical depression during a lifetime versus one in eight men. So it's also a sexist, this this diagnosis. Yeah. What what is what now? No, this is a fact. Okay. If you do, yeah, a community epidemiological surveys, that's a fact. Do you see that in your own Yes. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Well, that may or may not relate, but it's possible, yes. 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 That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yes, that's right. So so underneath, like William Styron, this is a good point, underneath the alcoholism, which men 
have higher rates of is this depression so it might even out at that point if you look underneath you say you all go off alcohol yeah I see a lot of working men that are being put on Prozac yes yes you're right so yes that's right yeah yeah of course that's not a a solution that what might happen is something address the problem at the job rather than to give Prozac (coughs) one out of six clinically depressed individuals eventually commit suicide and three out of five entertain thoughts about suicide if you if you do studies you'll find these uh, results so that's scary one out of six clinically depressed people will kill themselves that's why we need to know about this personally and professionally because you cannot help someone with severe depression clinical depression and the issue of suicide if you haven't gone down that path yourself and resolved the issue you cannot help patients it's not possible you go as far with the patient as you've gone with yourself this is why the only book written in Jungian psychology uh, called Suicide in the Soul is a dangerous book written by James Hillman There are seeds in there that are positive. But as we'll see when we go into the whole topical area of suicide, it's a potentially dangerous book because you can rationalize the suicide of your patient. Yeah. So is there a correlation here between the overall the race of depression and you also women may tend to overeat more than males or you know, they may drink more women? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if that specifically has, has been addressed, but it's a good uh, point, I think, about uh, the question is, do women overeat more to compensate or try to self-treat the depression and men might drink more? Lack of exercise uh, correlating with depression, those are all very good questions. podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.